Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on poetry and science communication. We've really been looking forward to the session this morning and to the conversation we're going to be having with four young scientists and science communicators about the interests and their experiences in using poetry in science communication. Uh, my name is Joanne Riley. I'm the science editor in the science communication division at FASTA, um, and I'll be facilitating the session this morning. Uh, we are joined by three of the contributors to a collection of poems that SASTA put together earlier this year uh, from entries into our Young Science Communicators competition. Um, that is Klo Masehela, Tayiba Tahir, and Lindiwe and Kabani. If you haven't yet seen the booklet, uh, we will post a link into the chat. We're also joined on our panel by an Australian published science poet and experienced science communicator, Ms. Rachel Rayner. Uh, but before we get into the discussion with our guests and panelists, I'd like to ask Mr. Michael Ellis, the manager of the Science Communication Division at SASTA, to say a few words and formally welcome everyone to the webinar. Thanks, Michael. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Joe. Um, so good to be um, with you all this morning, to the poets, to our international guest. Really such a privilege to be with you guys this morning. And thank you already up front for taking the time to our attendees. Wonderful to see some, some, some individuals that we know and some that we don't um, on the line with us this morning. So it really is good to uh, just connect with you all this morning and look at a, a bit of a different way of communicating science. You know, I, I love these creative spaces, these just uh, alternate ways to have conversations um, about science and with scientists. Um, I thought I'd start with a, a quote from another one of the, the poets that uh, Joe ref referred to in the, the, this booklet, Science in the Creative Fringe, uh, that uh, Joanne and Sasta put together. Um, Anya Ehlers says that poetry transcends uh, boundaries. As a scientist with a love for words, I wanted to explore the interconnections between these two seemingly opposite disciplines. My realization was that poetry can be science and science can be poetry. And I thought that was just such a beautiful um, summation of, of, of why we, we're having this conversation this morning. You know, I, I believe that both science has a lot to contribute to the arts, but the arts also have a lot to contribute to science. And I think if we can be more creative in the scientific space, we're going to be able to uh, achieve a lot more impact through the science that we do. And hopefully if we're also adding science, scientific thinking into the arts, that will also add value um, to the arts space. So this session really is part of the National Science Week uh, sessions for this week. Um, National Science Week is really an annual celebration of science. Um, interestingly, happens in South Africa, also happens in Australia, where our, our guest this morning is from, um, and, a, and a number of other countries across the world have National Science Weeks. So this formed part of a, of a bit of a different Science Week this year, because it's all happening online in the, in the digital space. Obviously, with a global pandemic, we couldn't have, have contact sessions this year, or it would have been difficult. And, uh, and so this is a digital Science Week this year. Um, and really, I think it's attracting a very different um, audience and, and, and different stakeholders into the, into the Science Week, which is lovely. And, and maybe next year, we're going to have some sort of a, a combined uh, um, uh, mode of doing Science Week, both online as well as physically interacting, as we've done in the past. Um, Science Week's theme for this year is making it possible through science. And really, this is all about um, ensuring that we're having dialogue and discussion about the role of science in broader society. What is the impact of science? You know, maybe de demystifying some myths or some correcting some, some false truths that are out there. It's about displaying South Africa as a home of science and innovation. You know, we, we believe that there's, there's areas of science that we are excelling in as a country, and it's about just do, are we having conversations about this? Are we proud about that as, as South Africans? And then obviously raising sort of awareness of what the, what the potential future for science is and for people getting involved in scientific careers. So Science Week is an initiative of the Department of Science and, and Technology or Innovation, sorry, um, in South Africa. And we as, as SASTA, a business unit of the National Research Foundation, implement this uh, Science Week uh, across the country. Um, so really uh, today I'd like to encourage you um, to engage, to engage with 
these wonderful four poets that we have uh, with us today. Um, you can engage through the chat box um, uh, or, or um, by putting, raising your hand maybe a bit later and, and having a conversation with us. Um, you know, really, I think in these conversations is where the, the, the wonderful um, engagement happens in a session like this. And really to also just to encourage, you know, these trailblazers, these uh, four trailblazers that we have sitting in front of us um, in this field of science poetry. You know, I think it's a it's a hopefully an emerging field in South Africa. Hopefully even this webinar will play a part in in stimulating other people to to look at it as a form of communication and a, and a form of uh, dialogue, in, increasing dialogue with uh, with science. So really, we I'm looking forward to the session. I trust you are too. And uh, looking forward to the uh, hearing from the poets too. Thank you. Uh, so much, Joe. Back to you. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, as um, I mentioned earlier, and to follow on what Michael said, um, you know, we've got um, contributors to to Sasta's uh, poetry book here, and our own interest at Sasta in exploring poetry um, in science communication has really been driven by these young scientists and the entries that we received into the competition. Um, so we noticed that there's really an appetite for young scientists to be expressing themselves and exploring poetry themselves as a mode of communication. Um, so yeah, as Michael said, these really are the trailblazers and they, they've driven us to um, become more interested um, in exploring this space and connecting people with science um, through art. So uh, what we're gonna do this morning, um, we are going to uh, play a video um, of a, each of, uh, a poem of each of these um, young poets. So our first three contributors to the booklet uh, further engaged with Sasta's digital uh, media team, who then um, through their own creativity put together a video of each of the poems to give a different experience um, to um, the poem that, than reading it, uh, reading the written word on the page. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, Lindiwe. <laughs> so Lindiwe Nkavani is the author of the poem Water Is. Uh, she is a budding scientist from the rural village of Nkwenni in KwaZulu-Natal. She has a degree in geological sciences and another in hydrology. She is currently working on her master's degree in hydrology at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Peter Maritzburg. She says, having grown up in a village, her career was closely guided by gaining knowledge to uplift her community, especially in the area of water and hence her chosen field of study. So I'm going to share with you her video. Let's get this right now. Okay. drastically through the craggy yet curvaceous mountains of the Drakensberg to the bustling yet contemporary villages downstream, channeled meticulously to the sleek concrete jungle, water dances in its abundance, the trees are tall and majestic, the exotic wattle drapes freely, the luscious grass moves swiftly to the touch of the wind, Namakolan blossoms in its beauty and color. The delicate insects in the soil thrive gracefully. The fish move briskly in their habitat. And the husky elephants lumber through the Kruger. The village gardens marvel with leafy vegetation. Children of the soil play candidly in the shapely rivers. The mines and the industries boom. Water is happiness and beauty. Water is power. Water is life. In its absence, the sight is agonizing. The grass has withered. The cattle are dying. The village squirms as dehydration dominates. And the wa for water among the big guns of the world has begun. Water is death. Water is violent. Water 
his war, save the world by saving water. So Lindiwe, I'd like to invite you to share with our um, attendees and our webinar participants what you wanted to convey through your poetry and how you wanted to express yourself. Good morning, everyone. Um, can, can you hear me clearly, Joanne, before I continue? Yes, perfect, yes. Okay, all right, thank you. So uh, with the poem, obviously, uh, the first uh, top stanzas of poem are just to describe and to illustrate uh, just how important water is and just how beautiful and green and lively our daily lives become um, in the presence of a good safe water and then what happens uh, when water all of a sudden diminishes or is poorly used is not saved uh, especially for future generations to come, not just for us. But the most important thing that I wanted to illustrate, uh, like he had uh, described um, my background at the beginning, is that having moved between two uh, from the village and then into Peter Maritzburg and Durban, uh, you see how people use water differently because of, of the immediate access they have of water in towns and the not so immediate access of water that people have when they're in the villages. You have to travel long distances uh, for water and the chances of you actually getting clean, safe water, even having traveled those distances because you share, you share it with livestock, agricultural purposes is also very low. So people in town uh, tend to use water as uh, a transaction because they pay for it. So there's that notion that, oh, we pay for it, so we can use it however we want to. But it's more it's more than that. Uh, you know, you just see it coming from the tap. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know how it gets to way to your tap. You know, there's the cleaning of water, there's the agricultural use, livestock, and all those other, other activities that adversely impact the water quality. Um, and then also increasing uh, water cleaning um, costs, they've, therefore increasing water payments through uh, the municipality. But however, I think the most important thing that I wanted to illustrate is the importance of water and also how violent water could possibly become and how that could be very detrimental to the lives of people that are actually already poor, you know, because, you know, as uh, we know in life, the poor are getting poorer and the rich are getting richer. And once water diminishes to the level that I wanted to describe, then it would come to an extent whereby only people that have um, that certain amount of power because water is also power, water is also economic. It's, it's, it's more than just what you see in front of you. I wanted to illustrate and wanted to put it in people's minds that you must see it more than it actually is. It's not just the water for your daily lives, it's more than that. So we use it efficiently and effectively, not just for us currently, but for future generations to come. So they also have, um, the the they they also can experience some of these uh, abundances and tall majestic uh, beautiful uh, picture that I was trying to illustrate at the beginning of the poem. Thank you. Thank you, Lindy. A really powerful and important messages. Uh, thank you. Um, if anyone has any you know particular questions for Lindy, please post in the Q and A. Um, she will she'll be happy to answer them. I'm going to move on to our next poet, uh, Taiba Tahir. So Taiba is the author of the poem Chemistry. Um, she is pursuing her PhD in chemistry at the University of Western Cape. Her research focuses on synthetic fuel innovations. Uh, she has always been passionate about science and always eager to motivate young students to further their interest in the field. She finds science communication is the perfect way to spread her passion for science, and she hopes to continue promoting science in fun 
and creative ways in the future. So let's share. Um, I have been learning by a tree, the central tree, the essential tree, roots deep down spreading into all science, branches spreading wide and vast, covered with leaves and colorful fruit, attracting those curious, hungry minds, ever growing tree, full of life, infinite learning to the sky and beyond, the tree that welcomes all. People have discovered many things here, finding solutions for health, water, pollution, and earth. Making lives of others better through hard work, passion, and dedication. Through molecules and microscopes. Solutions of color and wonder. As I sit under this tree, I feel inspired to make a difference. To learn and explore my mind, the world, the universe. Oh, it is a joyful experience. And I will tell others about this tree, hoping that they will seek it out, find it, love it, and enjoy it as much as I do. To take what they learn and use it for the benefit of humanity, as it can be done and has been done throughout history for a better, sustainable future for us all. So Tahiva, would you like to tell us a little bit more about what you wanted to convey through your poem? Yes, thank you. Um, so the message I wanted to share um, through the poem is that chemistry is a central science and it can be found in all other disciplines of science like mathematics and physics. Um, so the tree in the poem was used as a metaphor for chemistry as a subject and the branches spread out into all disciplines of science. Um, the poem also um, conveys the message that through chemistry, many discoveries have been made um, in the fields of medicine, healthcare, um, earth and water science and these have impacted um, the world and society in a positive way. Chemistry is very vast and there's always so much to learn and explore. And the poem emphasizes that chemistry is all around us and it can be enjoyed by all. That was the, um, the main message of the poem. Great, thank you, Taiba. Again, if anyone has any questions specifically for Taiba, please um, uh, post them in the Q and A, and she'll be happy to answer them. Uh, next, I'm going to introduce then our third uh, poet in today's session. That's Claude Masaela, and he is the author of the poem "As Tiny as I Am." Flo is a scientist at the South African National Biodiversity Institute and leads the program of work that focuses on monitoring and reporting on the impacts of genetically modified organisms on the environment. He is also the chairman of the Western Cape Bee Industry Association. He holds a PhD in entomology from Stellenbosch University. Flo's work and interests cover apiculture, crop pollination, conservation and biosafety. He is also passionate 
about educational outreach programs, and many of his talks are based on the subject of insect pollinators, such as bees. So let me prepare his poem. <laughs> okay. As tiny as I am, I'm as old as the pyramids of Egypt, yet my tiny body defies my age. I'm a vibrant soul that glows with the golden sunshine, and my hairs are interweaved with the shadow of darkness. I'm loved by a few and ignored by many. The Melissas of this world bear my name, but to many, I'm a killer. All are drawn to the sweet honey of my labor, but hate my sting, which can also heal them. As tiny as I am, adore me with credit for the beauty of your landscape. Clothe me with gratitude for the blossoming sunflower fields. Canola oil overflows from my toiling. Pollination that fits a nation. The sound of my buzz is music to many farmers. The buzz of income to many beekeepers. Call me nature's economic builder, even though I may seem to work less hard than you. As tiny as I am, you not only starve me, but blind me. You destroy my home and pollinate my playground. You claim to echo my importance to your well-being, yet your actions undermine my significance in your precious environment. Or am I as good as what I can do for you? As tiny as I am, I hear the threat to my fading existence rattles you, human. Natural systems might go off balance. Economies may collapse with my disappearance. Experts say you will cease to exist without me. Is your value for me as tiny as I am? So, please tell us more about your poem. Um, thanks, Joanne. Uh, just to confirm if you can hear me clearly. Yes, all good. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I think uh, most of us, when we were growing up, we could easily uh, see bees flying around us, uh, easily recognizable. But again, um, you know, we always hear how they sting and we are afraid of them at the same time. Uh, but then with the, the love of honey for most people, uh, it makes it also easy for them to relate. Uh, but then, yeah, over the few years, um, most people really came to know honeybees just because of um, the, the publicity, you know, the media attention with uh, the declines in, in pollinators in general, not just honeybees uh, alone, but other insects and, and birds and so on because of various threats to the environment. Uh, being the use of pesticides, uh, environmental pollution, uh, some acts of climate change, and so on. So uh, with the work that I've been doing on, on honeybees over the past uh, eight or so years, um, and uh, also contributing towards my PhD, I, I really felt that it was quite important to, to communicate the message around it, um, the awareness of the importance of honeybees just in terms of how they maintain our landscape uh, by pollinating different uh, indigenous plants that we have. And, and also the, the food crops. Um, I mean, most of you would know that a lot of the, the nut trees, uh, the fruit trees and some of the vegetable seeds that, that we consume daily are pollinated by, 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 by honeybees and other insect pollinators as well. So I really felt that that was quite a, a a good angle to, to communicate and to make people aware that these uh, little creatures are important for us. 
uh, the food we eat, the environment, and so on. And that it is our responsibility to take care of them. You know, we might not notice them daily as they fly around us and go about what they do best, uh, but then we, we must just keep it in mind that they are there. Uh, and as much as uh, we, we value what we eat and how our landscape looks like, it's also our duty to protect them and to look after them. So yeah, that was uh, pretty much the angle of communicating the message. Um, and I hope uh, that uh, most of us will get to look at them differently from now on. Thanks. Thank you, Claire. And I think again, uh, this um, poem also highlights, um, you know, science within the broader environmental and, and social issues that you know science exists in. And I think this is a, a good example of communicating around that. So thank you. So um, our next panelist um, is uh, Ms. Rachel Rayner. Uh, she is a published Australian science poet uh, and experienced science communicator who has shared her love of language and science with audiences all over the world. She explores poetry as a method of communication, presenting at the South African National Arts Festival, um, judging the Lifeology Science Poetry Competition, and co-authoring a paper in Axon Creative Explorations. Recently, she has published her own and co-authored poem in online venues, including Consilience, Visual Verse 521, and the Galway Review as well as reciting her limericks in a STEM punk podcast episode. Rachel is currently touring a one woman show that uses poetry to delve into particle physics. So I'm going to uh, show you a video of an animation of one of Rachel's poems, um, Photonics. Uh, so this has not been produced by Sasta. Um, in this um, animation, Rachel worked closely uh, with the graphic artist uh, to put the animation together. So this is a different um, creative expression uh, to what you have seen in the previous three videos, um, but really a, a wonderful piece of work. Uh, let me share in. Photonic. Divining the eye's reaction to the glow of a dying match the glinting edge of a tambourine, or rogue droplet skipping stones to join its kind in moonlight. Together they carry a force, a particular wave of energy, a tiny thing, two parts to a whole, both waving in sign language and making a measured point. Dancing between wave and sand, they see beyond their original pinpoint burst to travel straight, connecting harmonic impulse and building historic frequencies. Together we saw the flicker and flash, the movement of two parts, the forging of sensation. A chemical interplay formed a million photons, the spark that lit the leaping moonbright water, or the small space around the wick in a moody basement cafe. Two out of a million was all we needed to reach us, two out of a million to move us. Rachel, tell us about your poem. <laughs> Hi, Joanne, how are you? Great. <laughs> Great. Uh, yes, so this poem came about from, uh, I just, I think I just really love light and I love how much there is of it. We've got a whole spectrum here and it's something that I'm really passionate about. I think it's something a lot of people don't really know about or don't appreciate how complex the things are around us to, the simple things like seeing a candle, uh, how many chemical interactions and physical interactions are going on for something like that to happen. And what I really wanted to do is just shrink down to a quantum level and sort of explore the world around us like I was sitting on the back of a photon. And so the poem sort of evolved, evolved out of that, really. Um, yeah, and it was just playing with words and all these different puns we can get in there. There's quite a few puns in there too. So I wanted, uh, there is a bit, a little bit to dig into here too, which I like leaving those, I guess we call them Easter eggs uh, in a poem. Thanks. We're struggling a little bit with your sound. I don't know if mm. um, 
we can improve that. Um, while you do that, I'm just going to mm. go to the chat box. Um, uh, some really great comments coming through. Thank you so much, everyone, for all the positive messages to our poets. I, I think um, I think it's really wonderful to get such great feedback. Uh, does that sound any better, Joanne? I'm not sure. <laughs> a little bit. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe it is. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a little bit. I'll sit close to the microphone. Okay. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say about the artist too. Uh, so Matthew, um, amazing artist, South African artist actually. We got paired up through an international project uh, where he did a image um, in response to the poem. So I didn't direct the image at all. It was um, something the artist came up with himself. And then from there, uh, we spoke about creating a video itself and that that was all him as well. So I, I helped a bit on the timing. I made a few suggestions there but otherwise uh, everything just from the artist and I really appreciate his work. Awesome, yeah. Um, with your experience in science poetry and, and the work you've done around it, as we mentioned in introducing you, um, I wanted to ask you to really kind of then expand and give us a bit more of an overview of science poetry in general um, but maybe share a bit more about your experiences and um, some of the opportunities that are available around science poetry. Yeah, sure. Uh, I've been part of this for quite a number of years now. Uh, so uh, I was looking into this. Um, yeah, I think back in, back in 2015, I really started getting into it. So I think it's important with science poetry is that science poetry has always existed. It's, it's been around us all the time. There are famous uh, British poets like uh, Keats, who was an actual medical doctor and wrote as well. So a lot of his poems lean on his medical experiences uh, when he's writing, uh, writing those poems. So it's always been around. It's just that now we have a term for it, which I think makes it really exciting and really accessible. You can say, you know, this, this, we're looking for science poetry. We didn't have that term. We didn't know what we were looking for. And so I think uh, I was going to share the definition that we had for science poetry, but like all arts, the definition is not something to follow. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, but uh, so a colleague and I wrote a paper on science poetry. It was based on Australia to look at who's writing science poetry. Uh, and so to do that, we needed to create the definition. So we have a definition of uh, a science poem is any verse in which the author has correctly used scientific terminology, concepts, principle, or knowledge to provide an analytical view of the world or surrounding universe. The poem could be related or responding to stimuli or reflecting the scientific method in some way. But it's important to know the poem doesn't have to be about science. It's using that vocab, it's using that observation of the world around them uh, to express an idea. And all the poets today have just such beautiful poems uh, that I think would sit anywhere. They don't need to be in a science poetry journal. They can just sit uh, they, as poems in their own right too. So I don't think we want to be too strict about what is and isn't uh, a science poem because uh, in the end, defining poetry is just as complicated and leveled as defining what is science. You know, these are two terms that are really, really broad and they differ across cultures too which is something to keep in mind. Uh, so when looking at science poetry and who's writing it and where it's being written, we actually discovered the more women are writing science poetry uh, across our sample. So we had a sample of uh, 75 poets, uh, majority of which are from 100 poems. Uh, oh no, sorry, 100 poems and 100 authors uh, of which um, the majority were female. So I thought that was a really interesting observation that uh, this is a, a communication method that's maybe favoured more by women. But it doesn't have to be. It might be that women are being published more, which is uh, a nice twist on what we're used to, I think, as well. Uh, yeah, so to answer your question, Joanne, about where is science poetry happening? Where it's, um, it's, it's popping up everywhere. Uh, there's many competitions that are coming up online where you can enter your poems. Uh, there's a lot of ask for environmental poetry, which of course is 
is made really strong uh, with that element of science, as we saw in the Dinway's poem. I think it even feels as well, that really strong. Oh, actually, yeah, and, and, <laughs> and Peggy Bars too. They've all got that environmental element in it. So science poetry is really, uh, really valuable for telling those environmental stories. Uh, the Consilience Journal, the one that this poem, my poem has been published in, is a science poetry journal from the UK, and it is dedicated science poetry. Uh, and that accepts uh, um, the first, I think you just need to be the first 20 poets to submit a poem to them, and then they'll work with you to really refine it and publish it because they're very passionate about giving a voice to lots of people. Uh, then there are other uh, journals around the place. So I've got a pile of books next to me. Um, this uh, rabbit is an Australian, like it is Australian, yes, but um, it's a, a non-fiction poetry book. And so because it's non-fiction, it has different themes and topics. And uh, this edition is actually science. Uh, that is their theme. The one after that was form, uh, but it has to be non-fiction. So looking for those journals that, uh, around that um, uh, that accept, that are looking for poetry and just it's it's one of those things you just search. You just uh, Google search poetry journal, uh, like we do science journals, and then they'll come up and they'll have dates and they open for submission. Some are online, some are in print, uh, and they're, they're all over the place and they usually accept poetry from around the world. It doesn't have to be uh, the country of origin. Uh, there's also conferences and things, but I also think it's about building community around you. There's a poet in... Um, Malaysia, uh, whose name, so I don't get it wrong, um, Alvin Payne, and uh, sorry, in Singapore, and he really liked writing poetry, but didn't. There wasn't a journal around in his area. Uh, he didn't um, have other people he could talk to about it, and he just built the community. He talked to people around him, said, "I want to do this." Uh, you know, they had workshops together, they shared their poetry together, and they grew a community like that. So, I encourage everyone if you are interested in this. Uh, share your poetry, build that community and get everyone writing alongside you. Uh, I think that's a, it's a really lovely way to, to get together and share ideas and, and tell stories. Thanks so much, Rachel. Uh, we really appreciate your kind of experience and insight into this. Uh, I'd like to invite then all the panelists to turn on their cameras um, and um, yeah, be part of um, a broader discussion. Um, I'll keep an eye on the Q and A's and the questions in the chat, but we're also going to invite attendees if they um, would like to, to ask anything or make a contribution to, to raise their hand and we'll be able to activate your mic and video, whatever needs activating. Um, so yeah, please do engage with us, but I'm gonna kick off maybe some questions and just um, ask our panelists to um, perhaps comment uh, from their own experience and their own perspectives. What, how do they feel um, or what do they feel the value is of um, using poetry um, for science communication? Um, so anyone's welcome to, to give some comments. Hi, Joanne. Hi, Lindy. Where? Thanks. So, um, I've been uh, I've taken part in quite a few things. I also uh, take took part, pardon me, um, in the Fame Lab. I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with the Fame Lab. It's also an NRF um, program. I think also science and innovate innovation, whereby you they you sort of asked to uh, talk about your project, if you have a project or any science topic, uh, but you need to talk about it in such a manner that the lay in layman's terms, so you don't use science words so that people understand what exactly is it that you're doing. So you get scored on using uh, the simple, simple, simplest type of words and explanations in order to get your message across without using the big uh, science jargon whether it's hydrology, geology, or chemistry. So I, I, I've done that, and I've also taken part in another project called Amanzuichi Ubuntu, 
which has been done by duct and ground truth with also that is more practical it's on the ground where you are trying to teach people about the it's specifically about uh, talking to people that live along the rivers within the more umgeni catchment i'm not sure if people are familiar with that area but it's in kzn uh from uh moyo river towards um durban the harbor so we engaged with people uh it was in order to collect information and data in order to produce the state of of, of the rivers report right so i think using poetry for me when i was doing those things i, I when i was doing all of those things i understood i tried of uh came up with a sort of a light bulb to say that oh you can actually use such simple things people things that people are familiar with some sort of communication that people are familiar with that they know that they can understand so that they also get to understand their environment their um, surroundings in such a way that even when you go there they understand what you are there to do and how you actually do it and so they also become familiar with their surroundings and what you do we also encourage them to use science uh, citizen science tools to actually monitor their own water quality so that they too can produce the data to, that we need we also engage with them in solid waste we also try and engage with the municipality because of poor infrastructure or infrastructure failures but i found that poetry was one of the most liked forms of communication because it creates a sort of rhythm that creates attention you don't talk during the poem you click during the poem so people are quite attentive if they like what you're talking about you hear the clicks if they are connecting with you if they are listening to you and then after that you hear the questions or oh, people are actually listening they understanding what you're talking about they feeling the rhythm they feeling but they also getting the message right through so i found that poetry was one of the most popular forms of communication and when you try to put it in layman's terms people respond more quickly and they engage even more than when you just they and you become science because you're scientists yeah so yeah thank you thanks lindy well, that's uh that's a really interesting comment that it's um uh, well received and and popular amongst the i mean the people you're trying to communicate with i think that's a really important um message for scientists <laughs> that this is um, a valuable tool uh, any other comments that question the value of poetry and science communication um joel i can come in as well yeah thanks Claire. please go ahead yeah 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 i mean for me this was really my my first attempt at, at poetry I've, I've never done anything like this before um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, previously, as, as you said in the intro, I've, I've been quite involved in a lot of education and outreach, especially from uh, like primary school level, a little bit of high school as well. Uh, a few years ago, we, we got some funding through the National Lottery and the Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, where we had quite a big drive um, around the awareness of, of pollinators and in particular honeybees. And, and through that, we, we developed quite a strong element of educational material for to help teachers on the subject of pollination and focusing on the importance of um, food production and sustainability as an angle and 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 that's for me when when it really clicked that you know the, the, there was a need for quite a, a diversity of material uh, that could cater for for people at different ages and levels and so on and i think in line with one of the questions that was asked in the chat i think it was by Sipo. Uh, I mean, about the, the the language issue, and and that's where we started seeing some of the challenges that you know we uh, obviously some of most of the material we develop is, is is in English. We did a few of Africans material because of the farmers that we worked with at the time, and and um, so yeah, when the competition uh, started, I think it was twenty sixteen or seventeen or so. Um, I just took up the challenge, and I thought, well, maybe poetry will be a different angle. A lot of people relate to storytelling and um, the language is a bit simplified like Lindy we was saying and, and, and people can easily uh, relate, they can easily follow and, and it makes sense to them. 
and 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 that's when for me i thought maybe this was quite a good angle to explore and i now realize as well that uh, probably uh, there are more tools you know that one can use to convey the message outside just the original scientific peer reviewed publications that we mostly focus on and a few complex fact sheets and so on so i think this has really provided a, a new angle of just sharing information and learning and, and, and like I said, uh, with time, I think this can also uh, now use other uh, languages, mostly our indigenous languages that we have in the country to convey such important messages that we have. Thank you, Clara. Thanks for bringing in that point about the languages. I think it's, yeah, it's an absolutely a very important point. And I think poetry really does um, fit well in, in trying to, to communicate about science in, in different languages. Uh, we do have a question coming, um, or a participant raising their hand, but I'd maybe just like to, before we um, open up for him, just to ask um, Taiba if you had any other comment, uh, maybe from your perspective, um, that you'd like to add. Yes, um, I think also that bringing in multimedia with uh, poetry is a is a wonderful way to keep audiences engaged and um, get them interested. Um, the visuals of of Rachel's poem was like wonderful. So yeah, I think um, I think that's a good way also. Thank you, absolutely, and I, I mean people do. Um, uh, I take in messages in different ways. So, you know, the, the poetry is a written word, poetry is a spoken word, and then, and then bringing in video and audio visual component to all different ways that people can receive messages and engage with the content. So I think that's a very important point. Thank you. Um, we're going to uh, invite um, one of our attendees, Keith, Keith Gottschalk, to, to ask a question or to uh, make a comment. Please go ahead, Keith. Uh, hi, uh, the shortest poem I've written is called 20th Century Physics. Heisenberg felt uncertain. Planck went all to pieces. Schrodinger put out a saucer of milk. Einstein wasn't perturbed. He knew it was all relative. And Last poem I'll read is about the space shuttle tragedy when it blew up, uh, killing all the seven astronauts on board. They vanished, became sky, a rain of metal tears upon the land. Writhing, their contrail became a cenotaph, a wreath we laid on our voyage to worlds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Keith. Um, perhaps um, you could, as someone who's clearly experienced in, in writing poetry around science, perhaps you could give some words of advice to our young science poets um, based on your experience. I think we'd appreciate that. I think one of the challenges is see if you can use humor or fun or uh, satire to get people excited and interested uh, in it and if you can avoid using complex terminology which requires a footnote that's always helpful but don't be shy of putting in a footnote or two if it's necessary we're living in the age of wikipedia and google so your readers will be able to very quickly look up any meaning but above all keep up the good work there keep trying to write more poems and tell them to all the others who may be interested both science people and poetry people thank you thank you very much for your contribution keith that's um, great advice thank you so much um Maybe i'm good if i could come in there yeah sure thanks michael yeah Sure. Keith, uh, yeah, thank you so much for that. For our audience who, um, who didn't see maybe in the, in the Q&A, Keith is quite an acclaimed uh, 
um, South African poet um, and has written a book uh, called Cosm Cosmonauts Do It in Heaven. Um, and uh, yeah, it looks like a great uh, book. I haven't read it myself, but uh, certainly would love to get a copy. Uh, so yeah, just thank you to Keith for coming in uh, at, at short notice when we saw you in the participant list. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Michael. Um, Rachel, I'd like to pick up maybe on the, the last comment that Taiba had about multimedia um, using uh, to, to complement and to support poetry. I'd like to maybe hear your thoughts a bit more about that. Yeah, definitely. I, uh, I think this is something really interesting in terms of, of how much you want the reader or the listener to build an image in their mind and how much you want to feed them a particular image. So there, I think there is a fine line where you don't want to be too literal uh, with what you're doing with the poem and you want uh, the, the person to experience it, have an individual experience of your poem. So there's really interesting ways to explore how to use multimedia for different effects. And like I noticed particularly with um, Ku's poem that with the bees, watching the bees, I had a much more um, emotional reaction uh, to the poem than when I actually just read it myself. And I think there's, and there's a definitely, there's different experiences for any poem, whether you read it in your own voice and you read it yourself or whether you hear the author read it, uh, they can be, they can seem like two different poems. So when choosing what sort of multimedia uh, to use, I think there's, there's a lot to think about in how you want to, what you want to do with the poem, what do you want to communicate? Um, yeah, so yeah, I suppose my thoughts are, well, it depends what you want to do. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but I love, I love hearing poets read their own work. And there is actually in the poetry world, there's quite a distinction between spoken, po spoken word poets and written poets. Uh, and like the history of poetry is that it's, you know, it's song, it's spoken, it's meant to be a, 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 an oral art as opposed to a written art. Uh, so it has that history in it. Uh, but then, yeah, the reading a poem and the experience of reading a poem is very different. And there are things you can do on a page that you can't do when you're speaking something out loud. Uh, and then the spoken word poet is just a different branch altogether where it's performative, it's got speech, it's got movement, it's got facial expressions. Uh, and then you have the multimedia version too, which are you illustrating it? Are you, is it a dance piece that's going along with the poem? Uh, there are so many opportunities uh, with what you can do and adding those different layers. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, I think your comment about, um, you know, po the poetry regime being a spoken word, I think that links to what Lindy always said about um, people um, being pulled in and engaged through the rhythm, through the rhythm of, of, of the poem. And I think, um, I think that's really, yeah, really interesting and, and relevant. Um, maybe uh, any other um, panelists have some comment about the, the uh, feelings about the use of uh, other media with the poems. Any other uh, comments? Not okay. Then, then let's uh, shift gear. <laughs> I'd like to. We've got just a few minutes left uh, to maybe um, for our panel panelists to give share with us perhaps what sort of inspires them in, in writing poetry and what, how they approach it. You know, how, how, do, you, how do you even start? <laughs> Give us uh, some indication and share with us, please. Uh, I can jump in first because mine's gonna be very quick. I, I haven't written a lot. And uh, my, I actually differ to everyone here about the language thing in terms of I like big words. I like to use the big words and not tell people what they mean, but just have it as a sound. And it goes back to that oral sound of like that's the thing. So usually I'll find a word I really like and then sort of build build something around it, build a rhythm or a flow around it. Um, that's how I, I like it. I can inspired by science words. I think science has this whole vocabulary of things that are outside English you know there's a lot of Latin um, there's a lot of German words there's, there's a lot of words that are outside because um, I'm only I only speak one language so I've only got one word so science gives me something else that I can I can pull from so I like to start with 
the word science in her opinion. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, maybe Tahiba, I'd like to ask you, how, how do you start? How do you go about um, writing a poem? Um, so the first thing I think about is what, what's the message that I want to convey um, to the audience? Um, what is it that I want them to know about, uh, for example, chemistry or something related to the science that I do? And then I, um, I work around that and I try to um, bring in some creative elements just to keep things interesting because I know that not everybody is going to find um, something interesting that I find interesting. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I try to think of creative ways to get people excited. Great, thanks. Lindy, how, how do you approach it? Um, I'm more of an emotional writer. So I have to be in my emotions in order to get uh, the message right through. But also, like uh, uh, Taiba has just said, you think about the message you're trying to get through and you try and connect to the science that you practice. Um, and, then, and then I'm more of a, because of my time spent in, in the fame lab trainings, I'm more of a trying to convert my words into more layman's terms so that it's 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 easily um, understood but I think connecting your science to the message uh, it's it's where I also start thanks and Chloe from your side yeah I mean I would, I would echo the same, same sentiments uh, I think uh, that the audience is, is very important I mean who your message is directed to um, then if you can just break down into like, you know, I mean, the, the age categories and so on, that makes it even more easier. And uh, for me, the biggest thing is, is the, the simplicity of, of the language. Um, I mean, uh, the, less com the, the less complicated or complex it is, I think the better. It's, it's easy to follow. Uh, one can easily relate. And, and if you, you use the visuals, uh, like Taiba was saying, the, the, the pictures and so on, uh, that people can easily recognize when you are talking about something, you know, that, that makes even more sense because now it's in their space. It's something they can easily, you know, um, uh, relate with. Uh, that's, that's where it starts. And like I said, because for me, this is really a new field. I, I, I just try and I, I keep it simple and just think of if, if someone who's not in, in this field was to look at this or listen to this and really give their time to understand it, how long would it take them to, to really absorb everything and make sense of it? And, and I just say, if, if you keep it simple, um, it should definitely come through. And if the message is there and your target audience is right, then you should have that impact that it's meant to, to achieve. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you everyone for, for sharing that and for sharing your, your inspiration and processes. Um, we have just a couple of minutes before the end of the session, so I'd like to ask uh, and invite Michael to offer some closing words. Um, thank you, Michael. Joanne and, and to the rest of the panelists, as well as the attendees, yeah, just thank you so much. You know, as you're talking, I'm thinking that one of the beautiful things about a poem is it doesn't always provide all the answers. You know, it, it more importantly stimulates a question. You know, that often a, a poem is a bit of a mysterious kind of bit of writing, you know, and, and often I, I would read through a poem and think, sure, what is actually being written about um, in this poem? And I, I think that is one of the beautiful things about a poem is it, is it leaves, it doesn't try to provide the answers all the time, you know, it really just is about saying to an audience in a beautiful way, you know, here's a question that is interesting. And, uh, and I really think that you guys have done that through your your poems and even taking that to, to the next level of kind of this visual communication, you know, which I think as you've talked about, it really adds a depth to that poetry as, as well, you know, and there's so many, I think we've seen so many different ways of doing that from, from kind of Rachel's animation 
to other kind of expressions through the, the kind of visual side too. So this kind of combination of using different modes to ask this question and, and get uh, an audience or a, a group of people just thinking about science, I think is so valuable. So thank you very much um, for, for your beautiful presentation. Thank you for your time in, in just uh, in exerting and your, your minds into this poetry and, and creative space. You know, I think it's so valuable. I'm trusting that of the uh, 30, 40 odd participants we've had or attendees we've had today, there's hopefully going to be some more poets, you know, that there's, we're hopefully going to see some more science uh, poetry in, in the future. You know, I think it was so wonderful that we even got to hear from a more experienced poet in this se session that's been writing about poetry, both from a social perspective, you know, and, uh, but also from a, from a science perspective. So, you know, I, I, I think that the, 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 the depth of the session has been wonderful. So, Joanne, thank you to you for your driving of this, um, this initiative and, and uh, the poetry book and, and so forth. Please, if you haven't yet gone through the poetry book, please go through that. There are also little audio clips in the poetry book that you can click on and listen to the actual, uh, some of the poets uh, speaking or, or saying their poems. So please do um, go, go and engage with the poetry book on our website, Joanne, put a link in the chat earlier to uh, our international speaker, Rachel. Uh, lovely to have you back on board um, on National Science Week. You were very involved a couple of years ago. Great to have you back. So with that, um, thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you to the attendees. Uh, I wish you all the best for the rest of the day. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Wishing you a wonderful day, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the National Science Week program. Great. Have a good day. Bye, everyone. Cheers, bye.